Zozo, my name is David Peterson and this is the Art of Language Invention. Episode 7, Romanization Systems. Before I talk about romanization systems, let me introduce two vocabulary items. First, orthography. Orthography is the writing system and spelling conventions used by a group of speakers to write their language. Romanization, on the other hand, is a transliteration system using the Roman alphabet. Something I want to make clear, though, is that the words romanization and orthography are not synonymous. Every so often, the romanization or the instantiation of, a, of the Roman alphabet of a language will be its orthography. For example, the romanization of uh, English, uh, French, Romanian, German, uh, Albanian, those are all their orthographies. But this, for example, is the Japanese orthography. Here is that same sentence, though, in a romanization system. This romanization system, though, is not Japanese's orthography. It's not what speakers use to write the language. We'd never confuse those two things with Japanese, but sometimes with a conlang, uh, confusion can exist. Depending on the type of conlang you're creating, your romanization system may not be your orthography. So, I don't know, if you're creating an oxlang that you would like to use in the real world, perhaps your romanization could be your orthography. Same thing if you're creating a language for your personal use or a language that you want to use in your daily life. Or if you're creating, for example, an a posteriori art lang that's set in Western Europe. There, then maybe your romanization will be your orthography. However, if you're creating an art lang for a fictional race of people that are set, that's set in a world that is not in any way connected to our own world, then that romanization system you're creating is just for our use in the non-fictional world. It will have absolutely no reality for your speakers, except by an extraordinary coincidence where they happen to have simultaneously invented the exact same Roman alphabet and then use it in exactly the same way that you're planning to use it. Odds are low on that happening. If you're creating a fictional language, an art lang, and it's something that should have an orthography, or maybe it's a uh, language whose speakers have not invented writing at all, and it's just a spoken language, remember that the romanization is there for your use. Uh, that is, it should be, in my opinion, as simple and uncreative as humanly possible. Think of your romanization system the way that you would think of subtitles in a movie in a language that you didn't understand. I mean, it's cool if, like, for example, you're creating some subtitles and, you know, you, you change the color of the font and you make it look like kind of like a coral leaf with fancy gradients and, and what have you. But all that's really going to achieve is going to make it difficult to read. And the whole point of the subtitle is just so that you can read it. Think of your romanization system just like that. It's just there so you and others can figure out the cool stuff. That is what's going on with your language. It should be totally 100% transparent if you can make it that way. In designing a romanization system then, I adhere to this principle. A romanization system should be phonetic where possible and phonemic where necessary. In an ideal romanization system, every single glyph or sequence of glyphs will always be pronounced the same no matter where it appears in the word. Similarly, an ideal romanization system would never use uh, characters with accents or characters that basically aren't, aren't found on the ASCII keyboard. Finally, an ideal romanization system would be largely intuitive for speakers who, uh, or for, for language users who are familiar with the Roman alphabet. Obviously, these three goals can be at odds at certain times, so then you have to make choices. At all times, I advocate for doing what is simplest, both for you and your potential reader or user. For example, this is English's vowel system. Look at that, just a mess of vowels. Yet we do fine representing these vowels with just these six graphemes, plus some extra consonants that, jump, that jumble things up. I mean, I know that's kind of kooky, but of course, uh, this is an orthography, not a romanization system. That is, there are historical reasons that this orthography is that way. It doesn't need to be that way when you're creating your romanization system just for your own use. And, in fact, if you wanted to, you could represent English's vowels even more simply. For example, this way. This is, I think, from my uh, Petersonian English alphabet that I did years ago. Uh, I mean, 
It's, uh, you know, you may not like it, but uh, that does the job. Also, here is the full vocalic inventory of Dothraki. Look at all those bizarre, crazy vowels. But the way that we represent it is just with these four graphemes. That really does the trick. The reason, though, is that a lot of what you see here is just the result of simple allophonic variation. So, for example, after uh, uvular consonants, there's just one, you see the following vocalic alternations where you have these cardinal vowels uh, becoming a bit more essentially uvularized or back. And then after, uh, after dental consonants, rounded vowels, there's only one of them, unround. So that's all that you see that's happening there. So rather than spelling them differently for each instantiation, for each different phonetic variant, uh, it makes much more sense just to use the phonemic vowel there. Sometimes the Roman alphabet fails you and you really need to do something different. For example, something common is for a language to have a series of retroflex consonants that contrast with a series of either alveolar or dental consonants. If it was just one of those, you could just use T or D. So for example, if you only had a retroflex T and a retroflex D, you didn't have a dental or an alveolar, you could just use regular T and D for that and just make a note of it in the pronunciation. If you have to distinguish the two though, that's when you either have to jump to use a separate character or use a digraph. So for example, uh, a great one for retroflexes is to just put an R before the consonant. If you never have a situation where you have a retroflex consonant preceded by R, um, that contrasts with a retroflex consonant preceded, I'm sorry, a non-retroflex consonant preceded by R, and then each of those in isolation, then you can get away with something like this fairly easily. If you decide ultimately that you're going to have to use a different set of characters for your romanization system, there's something I want you to keep in mind. Obviously, it's going to take extra effort to type these special characters, and it's going to require extra effort on the part of your readers to figure out what they are, and how they're pronounced. So, something that I think you should ask yourself, is it buying you anything not to simply use IPA? That is, forget about the romanization system and just type in a broad transcription using IPA symbols. After all, then you don't have to explain why something is pronounced the way it is. You could just say, look it up in the IPA. Um, you know, because if you're going to have to install an entirely new keyboard layout just to type some fancy character for like an unrounded, back, nasalized, overlong, whispered, creaky voice vowel, then really, I mean, what's the point? You might as well just come up with some convention using IPA characters and just transcribe it then, you know, people will be able to know exactly how it's pronounced just by looking at it, provided that they learn IPA. And if you think, oh, well, they're never going to learn IPA, they are going to have to learn your transcription system. So it's, you know, one or the other. And honestly, one is going to end up being more useful down the road. So the point I'm trying to make here is that this thing is just a romanization system. It is not an orthography. I mean, if it is an orthography, if it's something like an a posteriori Western European language, fine. But if it's just for you and your readers or viewers or users to figure out exactly how something is pronounced, I mean, don't put creative energy into that. It should be a matter of seconds deciding exactly how each phoneme is going to be spelled in this romanization system. Put all your creative work into the actual creation of the language or into creating the orthography, that is, what the writing system is going to be like, what writing implements they're going to use, what they're going to write on, how the system will have evolved over the years, how that will have affected spelling and things like that. The romanization system should really just be totally 100% transparent. The easiest and simplest way for somebody else to figure out how your language is pronounced. That's it for this episode. If you have a question you'd like for me to answer on the show, Leave me a note in the comments or send me an email to djpquery at gmail.com. If you want to see more episodes like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.